Hi everyone, I'm Jessica Deruzza, and this is the Trust Psyche podcast on archetypal astrology and depth psychology. I'm a psychotherapist, astrologer, and teacher, and I absolutely love what I get to do. I work with people from all around the world and all walks of life in my private practice of working with individuals and couples, and I also get to work with clinicians where I offer supervision and consultation for folks who are seeing clients and in some way including astrology. I also run an online school with my husband, Travis Deruzza, where we have courses that you can take right now, whether you're brand new to astrology or a lifelong professional astrologer. And we are just over the moon that we get to do what we love. Travis also offers archetypal astrology readings and does counseling. You can find us at trustpsyche.com and when you enter your email address there, you will receive in your inbox all of our latest astrology videos, podcasts, articles, newsletter, and any events that we're doing. Thank you so much for being here with us. We love you and we hope you enjoy this episode. Happy 2024, y'all. It's January 30th and it's a brand new year and I'm feeling it. This is episode 43, and I'm just really stoked to not be in 2023 anymore. Good riddance. That was a hard year for so many of us, and I know it was very challenging for me and my family, and I'm already loving 2024. It just has a lighter vibe to it. It feels full of possibility again, and there's a lot of forward movement. Today, when I'm recording this episode, all planets in the sky are direct. Um, I always think that's a really special time astrologically because it just has this feeling of everything is in sync and moving forward. And it tends to be a time where we're able to take action and move forward with the things in our life that we've been thinking about, sitting on, planning, preparing for, gestating, all of those things. And so there's this quality of, all right, let's go. And I think when you also combine that with Jupiter picking up speed here at seven degrees Taurus and moving back towards Uranus, which is curly at 19, there's just this momentum of the Jupiter Uranus building. And I just think that we're all in for a lot of big surprises. Jupiter Uranus is one of my favorite alignments as an astrologer, um, just because it has this really kind of big electric energy and it tends to feel very exciting because Uranus brings in new beginnings and new possibilities. Um, Of course, it's the trickster and so there's a lot of unexpected qualities. It's like the fool jumping off the mountain right? It's that leap into the unknown and the mystery. But when you get it with Jupiter, it tends to amplify that process and also bring in that feeling of success and good fortune, abundance, gifts, blessings. And there's a blossoming of a renewal of rebirth and awakening that tends to feel just very electric. And I personally like that energy. I also am someone who loves to take risks and go big. Um, I love to gamble. And Jupiter Uranus is the risk-taking gambling archetype. And I also love surprises. I'm someone who's always loved surprises and to be surprised. And so um, because I probably have a natal Jupiter Uranus alignment, it's a familiar energy to me that I resonate with and there's just a knowing there so personally I feel excited about this Jupiter Uranus alignment it's picking up speed and it's just going to keep getting tighter and more potent um, through March and April where it peaks in exactitude at about 22 degrees Taurus and will be there through May um, still really strong so what we want to be aware of in our lives is just noticing the places that are really needing change And if there's something that you're feeling excited or hopeful about, um, where you can feel a sense of opening into new possibility, it's a great time now and in March and April and May of 2024 to align yourself to be able to both say yes to the unknown, but also to take big chances and big leaps. Of course, we want to stay grounded and centered and all of that. 
but it's a time for big change and those big surprises to come in and um, the hands of providence to guide our lives and personally um, that excites me and I just think we're going to see again a lot of um, breakthroughs technologically uh, scientifically we're already seeing so much with AI and I think there's just going to be some incredible awakenings that humanity is going to be going through in this year that does have a quality of taking a quantum leap in our consciousness in all realms and aspects of life so life so whether that's on the collective level whether that's happening within the realm of science or technology or in your own personal life and so just be tuning in and staying present to, you know, if there's some big changes in your life that um, are going to be happening and it seems like that window of time is going to be here um, in March, April, and May, I would just say, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, astrologically, that is the window of time where that is going to be happening in just really big ways. And the tendency for Jupiter is to bring success and good fortune. Of course, um, if we're um, ungrounded, if you know we're not showing up for <laughs> the work that we're doing here in our lives, then it can be a, a, a pretty big disruptive chaotic energy. And also has a lot to do with how good are you with change? How much do you enjoy surprises? Um, you know, what's your relationship with the trickster archetype with Uranus? So I'm just feeling that and I'm feeling excited about it. And I just wanted to share some of that excitement with you. I also just had one PSA that I really wanted to make in order to clear my pipe so I can share what I want to share today, which is this. If you live in the United States and you have student loan debt from going to school, as so many of us do, as I did, you know, I'm someone that had to take out loans in order to go to uh, college. I had to take out all the loans for both my undergrad degree and my graduate degree my master's in counseling psychology. And so if you're listening to this and you have student loan debt that you're paying back, um, do yourself a favor and go to studentloantutor.com. I've been working with these folks for the last five years and they have completely um, changed the well financial well-being of my family. Um, they essentially uh, work with you to get your student loan payment down to as close as, to zero as possible. Uh, and for many of you, it will be zero or very close to zero dollars a month where you're still legally paying off your student loans. However, they know tax law in and out, and they're originally based out of the San Francisco Bay Area, and their life's mission is to help folks who need uh, help paying back their student loans. And I've worked with them. A lot of my um, colleagues have worked with them, and I only hear positive things. They're professional, they're friendly, and very informative. So you can get a consultation with them, and they can let you know based on your um, sit specific situation how they can help. And I just really wanted you guys to know that. So studentloantutor.com, let them know Jessica DeRuzza sent you. All right, so here I am. Today's episode is called Being, on Being Autistic in the Aquarian Age. So this is how I want to start with this. Hi everyone, I'm Jessica Drutza and I'm autistic and I'm really proud to be autistic. It's something that is deeply meaningful to me and honestly very helpful for me to both identify as being autistic, being on the spectrum, and also getting to, in my own way, share my journey with you about what being autistic is for me. So some of you are going to hear this and go, well, that's obvious, Jess. <laughs> and some of you are going to go, huh? No, you're not. And then there's going to be some other reactions. You get to have whatever reaction you're having. I had most of them myself. And I want to share with you what my journey around realizing that I'm autistic has been. It was actually a huge part of what 2023 was for me and my family, and I'm going to be sharing vulnerably today some of that story, but it's also going to be coming out in pieces because it's something that I'm continuing to learn and discover, and it's something that I think 
in order for me to really integrate what it means for me, I need to be able to share it. And that's always been my process here in my life and definitely on this podcast. So first, I want to begin by saying being autistic essentially means that my brain works in a different way than folks who are neurotypical. So it's really important here to be aware that there is no normal, but the way that we currently talk about it is that folks are neurotypical and then folks who are neurodiverse. And being on the spectrum um, can mean that you are autistic. And being autistic is something that I've had to learn about and I continue to learn about every single day. I learn about it from folks that I really trust who themselves are also neurodiverse and spend their life both researching and teaching and educating folks about what it means to be autistic. Um, I really love the work of Andy Putt from Mrs. Speechy P. Um, She is the best resource that I have found so far that has helped me on this journey. I love following her on Instagram and I've read her uh, handbook that she offers, which is excellent. So if you're wanting to know more, that is a excellent trusted resource Um, because it is a very uh, neurodiverse affirming platform. She is a speech language pathologist who works with autistic folks. And it's really important that when we're learning uh, about what being autistic is, that we're learning about it from people who not only work compassionately with folks who are autistic, but I think it's also best to learn about it from people who themselves are autistic or identify as being neurodiverse, which can include being uh, ADHD. So um, what is important to know about being autistic is that it's there's absolutely nothing wrong with it. Uh, there's nothing bad. Uh, nobody's done anything wrong. Uh, nobody caused this by doing something uh, you know, wrong in the process of being a parent. It's not because um, you got vaccinated. It's not because, uh, you know, you, you didn't spend enough time with your child or talking to them or whatever, all the hocus pocus, uh, that's out there around that. No, being autistic is a very natural part of human development and human evolution. Um, the way that things seem to be structured here on earth for us homo sapiens is that we have different brain types and we have different um, ways of learning and processing information. So folks who uh, are neurotypical uh, process, learn, communicate, and socialize in uh, certain uh, types of ways. And of course, there can be a lot of variation within that. And just so can folks who are autistic. There is a lot of variation in that. Just like folks who are neurotypical, people who are autistic can be introverted or extroverted. They can have different levels of empathy and compassion, different types of intelligence, emotional intelligence, relational intelligence, uh, different IQs, right? All of that. So um, being autistic or being neurotypical um, it really is not about it being anything other than folks who are on the spectrum have um, four things in common. One, we process um, language differently. We process information differently. There's a difference in the way that we communicate, that we socialize, that we learn, and that this is all actually, I think, both beautiful and a necessary part of human evolution. And this is why this is called being autistic in the Aquarian age, because this is truly about what diversity actually means in this world today. So what we're saying here is that the Aquarian age is about being uniquely who you are as an individual. So whether you are neurotypical or neurodiverse, whether you are uh, straight, homosexual, LGBTQ+, queer, trans, um, whatever your sexual orientation is, whatever your religious views are, your spiritual views are, like we are all coming from different worldviews and paradigms in the Aquarian age 
actually is about the awakening and celebration of inclusivity, of truly genuinely getting to a place in our human evolution where society is not only affirming people in our differences, but actually structuring how everything works from education to um, the medical system to uh, the government and so forth is built from a place of truly honoring that we are all different and we all have different strengths and we all have different things that we need support around. This is what inclusivity actually means. And the part that I'm gonna be focusing on today is the inclusivity of being neurodiverse and how actually wonderful it can be to wake up to the reality that you may be autistic and to wake up to the reality that I'm autistic and that by doing that, I actually am able to celebrate my gifts and my abilities, but also to have more self-love and compassion for myself in taking better care of my needs because there are certain things that are challenging for me in life that is different than folks who are neurotypical. And it just so happens that our education system, uh, uh, the way that our medical system works, and the way that we uh, believe uh, we should relate and socialize to one another sometimes actually can be really harmful to me and other folks who are on the spectrum because it is um, not allowing for the ways that we are different. So that's kind of my initial overview, but now I wanna share a little bit more of my personal journey of how I realized that I'm autistic. And for those of you who also are autistic or um, have someone in your family who's autistic, I think you're gonna be able to relate to what I'm saying. So here we go. Um, a lot of adults who didn't realized that they were autistic, who weren't diagnosed as autistic as a child, um, often realize they're autistic because they have a child who's on the spectrum. Um, for those of you who follow this podcast, you'll remember in the fall of 2022, I did an episode about my daughter, Luz Sophia, who is now uh, three years old, um, went to daycare for the first time when she was two. And after a few weeks of being there, uh, very unskillfully, the teacher at the time said, you know, I, I think she's on the spectrum. Have you had her checked out? I didn't like the way the teacher went about it, but it turns out that if a teacher is saying that, even if it's unskilled, um, it's a good reason to find someone who is compassionate and knowledgeable about being on the spectrum to, uh, get support from them and hopefully to get an evaluation because there's so many benefits of doing that I have found. It's a personal choice for everybody, but it's something that's been incredibly supportive for our family. So over uh, the last year, worked with different uh, programs here in Sarasota, Florida, where they came into the home with uh, a therapist, a nurse practitioner, a social worker, and essentially we just got to be together and talk about our daughter and what she's like and what we've noticed and you know for her to to um, interact with these folks and you know everyone is very uh, afraid of saying the word autistic um, even people who work with folks who are autistic or people who are autistic themselves it's like this very taboo word and that's why I'm saying it so much because it's really important that we can say the word autistic just like we say the word hamburger it's like yeah I'm autistic autism here we go so um they weren't able to give a diagnosis and they didn't want to use the word autistic but essentially through wink wink nudge nudge uh hey check out this resource you might discover some things in it uh essentially they were saying yeah we think your daughter is autistic now here's the wild thing is um, as is the case with a lot of things when it comes to mental health, comes to brain development, um, being autistic um, shows up differently in often um, in girls. Um, girls uh, tend to just naturally be more called to be social, uh, relational, um, but also uh, are much better at masking. Um, hiding or internalizing 
um, certain uh, kind of classic traits of being autistic. And so oftentimes girls will go undiagnosed because they have things like eye contact or they have language or they have empathy and it has become increasingly um, heartbreaking to me to um, wake up to these stereotypes that are really not helpful and are very archaic Um, and I think that I know what it's like to have gone through that. I used to not know um, what autism is and how to understand it or recognize it out of the stereotypes that are based upon mostly like five-year-old white boys with certain types of behaviors. So a lot of times people will think being autistic means not being intelligent or being antisocial or not having empathy and that's just absolutely not the case also there's stereotypes like people who are autistic will never be able to have a job or live on their own or um, have families and again that's just not true Um, as everything is on a spectrum and everyone has different abilities and gifts and things they need support around whether you're autistic or not um, folks who are neurotypical go through the same thing so it's really important that we decouple those stereotypes so that folks who are on the spectrum can get the support they need because often there is certain kinds of support that we need. Um, So for our daughter Luce, the main way that we noticed it was from a neurotypical standpoint uh, and a measurement in milestones, which the medical model is all based upon neurotypical folks, there was a language delay and it's common in um, children who are autistic for there to be a difference in language development. A lot of folks who are on the spectrum actually um, are what is called gestalt language processors. So instead of being analytical in their language development and in their uh, speaking, um, you know, the analytical way is you learn pieces to whole. So you go, you learn that's a dog, that's a cat, that's milk, that's an apple, and you learn these single words, and then eventually you start to string them together in sentences. And most people think that's the only way language is developed, but it turns out there's this other way that language is developed. In Gestalt language processing, you can check out um, uh, meaningful speech on Instagram or on their website, and this has been another Um, equally incredibly useful resource um, to get educated on for myself as a therapist who also loves to work with children but also in parenting my own child and advocating for her. Gestalt language processors um, and I think a lot of astrologers are probably gestalt language processors and you're going to see a lot of overlap here. I think actually a lot of folks who are astrologers probably are autistic. I think there's a lot of Um, common ground there with symbolic thinking and our ability to um, take whole impressions in and for those of you who are um, highly intuitive and um, I would I would guess that for a lot of us and this is the case for me that astrology is one of my special interests and I have dedicated my entire life uh, to astrology Uh, folks who are autistic tend to be very enthusiastic and passionate and full of love for whatever it is they're interested in and that can be anything those are called special interests and we tend to get very passionate not obsessive right (laughs) let's use uh kind language they're very passionate and focused highly focused on what it is that we're drawn to and when we are able to follow those things really incredible things happen so anyways gestalt language processors my daughter is a glp and so am i and essentially you learn language through modeling so instead of learning that's a cat that's a dog one two three abc you actually learn language by having incredibly emotionally uh, and meaningful experiences that leave impressions on your being and then there's language that's attached to that we learn through scripting so we don't learn through single words we actually learn through what's called scripting and sentences um, we are intonation babies so we speak melodically um, we're musicians a lot of musicians are autistic because we hear the world through melody and syncopation which i think is also a big part of what astrology is is 
the archetypal melody and syncopation or timing or rhythm of life through the cycles and seasons. You can also hear in the tone of my voice how enthusiastic and syncopated I am when I unmask. There is an incredible amount of passion that comes through and you can hear that fluctuation and intonation in my voice. Um, that is a very common trait of someone who is autistic. So my daughter learns through modeling. So instead of that's a um, you know, uh, do you want some Cheerios? Instead, you say, I am hungry. Um, I want food. Uh, you use first person uh, language to give the child the scripts that they need to be able to um, effectively communicate with other people. Uh, so without going super far down that road, um, there's a lot more there I want to say about that. But how incredible is that to discover that there is another way that language develops that we are not taught in school. My daughter Luce has Mercury station retrograde tightly opposite Uranus. This is a classic example of a Mercury Uranus alignment, which is the uh, new way of learning, uh, a new way of understanding language development. And how cool is that, that through my child, that I got to wake up to the fact that I am also a Gestalt language processor, and now all of my educational history makes complete sense, including the way that I learned astrology, which was through downloads and transmissions of holes to parts. So I learned about the archetypal realm as a emotional felt experience that was energetic that then I learned to put language to. It wasn't the other way around. Like I didn't learn Venus means love, Uranus means change, Saturn means maturation. I didn't learn it in that analytical way. I learned it as a whole experience. I experienced all of the planets of all of the archetypes, honestly, through my psychedelic experiences and altered states of consciousness, also through my dreamscape. It's very Mercury Neptune of me to have learned astrology through both um, non-ordinary states or expanded states of consciousness and through my dreams. And so it was through this meditative contemplation of uh, receiving the whole gestalt of the meaning of the planets that was first a uh, cosmological, metaphysical, and philosophical inquiry that then very quickly turned into being able to read charts and then honing this different skill set, which is holding... Uh, sacred space in a counseling or therapeutic way. But the actual learning of astrology and the meaning of it happened in a gestalt language processing way for me. So my daughter, as is the gift with our children, uh, woke me up to aspects of myself that were always there, but that I hadn't have any um, frameworks for. Part of what's incredible about it is our children are mirrors, but you know, you think, oh yeah, you're going to show me, you know, my shadow or you're going to show me generational cycles that I need to break. Yes, absolutely. And you're going to show me things I didn't even know were possible to show me. And I think that level of reception was something that was always my intention way before I ever had children. Actually, it was through my uh, first uh, download of the archetypal realm that happened in uh, mid-October of 2007 um, uh, on a, um, a high-dose LSD experience that um, also was my initiation into wanting to become a mother. I was 20 years old. I had no desire of being a parent up until that point. And I literally love that the coincidence of learning astrology and becoming a parent happened at the same time for me. And I just think it's an incredible return moment um, in waking up to the fact that my daughter is autistic because what it's doing is it's returning me to my roots, my roots in my childhood, my inner child, but also my roots as an astrologer, which is um, I just knew that for me being a parent was about doing my best to be able to hold safe, loving, sacred space for the exploration and development of the consciousness of the soul that wanted to incarnate through me and my husband Travis and that our home was always going to be a place of unconditional love and acceptance and that we would work on ourselves for any limitations that we had in wanting to control or condition our child and 
having a child who develops differently than the standard way that we're taught is a very scary process. Um, it's threatening on so many levels to your supposed dreams and wishes, what your ego thought, your identity as a parent. It really makes you question yourself to the core and look in the mirror because what folks who are neurodiverse, as I think all children need, are parents who are willing to do their inner work to work on their own triggers and limitations to then be able to show up in unconditional love for the being that is present. And that is no easy task. Conscious parenting, gentle parenting, uh, peaceful parenting is an incredible revolution that is happening right now. And I do not think that without that revolution of understanding parenting and the parent-child relationship, would we be able to have such a compassionate approach to uh, being neurodiverse. So uh, I want to kind of connect this back into the Aquarian age, which is we know that Aquarius is about the championing of the individual, no matter how unique, eccentric, different um, one is, it is about really embracing that kind of uniqueness. And I really like the word unique for Aquarians and the Aquarian age and for the planet Uranus. There's a lot of overlap there. And I think part of the dawn of Aquarius is actually all of us learning and unlearning how to decondition ourselves and find out who we really are, not who society thinks we should be, not who our parents, not through all the institutions of civilization, but to get to unmask. And so for me, unmasking, which is a big part of unlearning the ways that I had to hide being autistic, um, is, I think, something that is happening on a collective level for humanity right now is that humanity is learning to unmask. And I think the Aquarian age and now the planet Pluto having entered into the sign of Aquarius for the first time in a couple hundred years, it's going to be there for the next 22 years or so, that this is a time period of unmasking. And that is no easy task because a lot of the reasons why we've had to hide who we are comes from fear and control, that we think that there's something wrong with us or that we're bad for the way that we are for the needs that we have and for the ways that we express ourselves and Aquarius is very much about um, expression and how we create and share that in society I mean Aquarius is as much about society and the collective but it's about how we individually uniquely show up in the co-creation of everything and you know at the root of that of course is civilization so part of sharing my journey is me unmasking. It's really important for me to um, advocate for being autistic as the number one to advocate for that for my daughter. They often say, particularly with the mother-daughter relationship, that mothers need to be very mindful of how they look in the mirror and what they say about themselves because our daughters know us better than anybody else and are looking in that same mirror and seeing themselves. And usually that is typically reduced to physical things, you know, women having a lot of often um, body shame, body dysmorphia, eating disorders. Um, I mean, in a way, it's like I think every woman has an eating disorder, but that happens, I think, also on a spectrum. And that's not to take away from people who are um, uh, bulimic or who um, are anorexic um, or who are um, in any way struggling with those forms of eating and with the body. But I think that women are so conditioned to be so incredibly self-conscious about our weight and our look and our shape that as mothers, our daughters are learning about their body and their sexuality, or I would more say their erotic nature, um, by the way, mothers look in the mirror. Well, I think that that goes beneath being skin deep. And um, the way that I talk about myself um, you know, including my, my mental health and including, you know, how I am uniquely structured. My daughter is looking in the mirror and seeing that about herself. So the number one way that I can advocate for my daughter being autistic is by coming out and saying that I am also autistic. And that's really, I think, the most important thing that I can do for Luce. And the reason why I'm saying that is what it turns out is, is, um, we don't know entirely how um, uh, autism works, 
but it is believed that it's typically passed down through one or both parents and often through the mother. And so I do believe that I come through a, a maternal line of being on the spectrum and I can now see it more clearly now that I have language and a framework for it. And so what often happens is when a parent realizes their kid is on the spectrum, they pretty quickly, for me it was within 72 hours, realize that they're on the spectrum and it's a really common occurrence. So I realize right now that I'm saying a lot and a lot's coming through and I kind of want to just dial back for a second and tune back into how I'm doing here before I continue on what I want to share today. There's so many layers and dimensions to this story and it's not going to be all able to come through today, but I do think that for me, a lot of going through my personal transit of Pluto squaring my moon and becoming a mother and having a daughter and starting my family, the kind of to dumb ending moment of it for me, which is the process of um, the third act. It's, it's the resolution of the story for me ended in this awakening that Luce is autistic. And we now are getting her all of the support she needs. So she works with uh, a speech language pathologist who is um, totally versed in gestalt language processing and loves working with kids who are autistic. We also have her doing that at her occupational therapist. It's this amazing place called Sensory Solutions. And it's just this really cool, like, gymnasium, essentially, with trampolines and swings and all kinds of awesome sensory toys, ball pits, where Luce gets to go and do occupational therapy every week. That then also, in a different session, helps her with um, her language development. And um, we also have her in a really awesome preschool where it's for kids who are neurodiverse. And I feel so much love and support of the community coming together. And I feel so blessed to be autistic in 2024 because it's so different than it was even just a couple years ago. And I have tremendous amount of compassion and tears for folks on the spectrum before this time. And all of the misunderstanding and um, harm that has come. And for mothers um, and parents of neurodiverse kids. Because it is challenging. It is, it is not a walk in the park. And there are a lot of reasons for that that I'm going to get to at some point. But I'm going to say this. A lot of my unmasking is being able to share who I authentically am. And one thing that uh, particularly adult females who are autistic do is they internalize a lot of these issues and live with anxiety. And anxiety is something I've lived with um, most of my adult life. I actually lived with it my whole life. And as a child, it manifested as separation anxiety, pretty serious separation anxiety, um, mostly um, from my mother. And that's a common uh, quality for folks who are autistic is as a child it manifests it can as separation anxiety so as an adult um it's something that i actively work with every single day and i treat anxiety in my clinical practice so you know both living with it and also treating it i have a lot of experience with it and i love i love working within it um, but it's a daily practice to do it and so part of my mental health is unmasking which includes me being able to do all the things I need to take care of my sensory needs a lot of folks who are on the spectrum also have sensory processing disorder and so they need extra support around tending to um, their eight senses and whether they're hyper or hypo so uh, in our case uh, people say well what are some ways you deal with that okay for example um my daughter needs to do a lot of swinging and so we have an outdoor swing and an indoor swing for her to be able to swing as a form of self-soothing at any time she needs to regulate her nervous system. I've also installed a hammock in my living room which is the main way I take care of my need for motion and self-soothing and regulating my nervous system 
And we also have a little mini trampoline where Luce can jump up and down. Jumping up and down on a trampoline, running and crashing into things is very common, um, especially for kids who are autistic. And this is something that when we give um, our daughter access to, she gets to self-regulate. And when she's self-regulated, then she's able to be with us and be more present and focus on other things. Also sensory deprivation. Um, I've turned my um, office into sensory deprivation. So on the uh, one day a week, I, I, I deprive my senses. So I, for example, I black out my room. I turn off my phone and my computer. I don't listen to any news. I don't go onto social media. And there's a complete stopping of as much as possible anything coming in or going out so that I can really feel myself and be in myself and in my center instead of constantly processing. Being autistic means that I don't have the same filters in place that neurotypical brains do. I have a difficult time compartmentalizing and my senses can go into overload or overstimulation because so much is coming in at once. That's also why a lot of folks who have um, intuitive or even psychic abilities also tend to be neurodiverse. Those things uh, tend to go hand in hand. I like to think of autistic folks as the witches and the wizards and the warlocks, um, you know, the, the Harry Potter folks. And um, it's been just really special to be able to be uh, a neurodiverse parent and have a neurodiverse partner. I'm sorry, neuro, neurodiverse child. And Travis, um, he is neurotypical. So um, he, though, uh, grew up with folks who were neurodiverse. So he has a deep affinity and attraction to folks who are neurodiverse and having uh, friends who are autistic and so on. So um, he loves and celebrates us uh, being on the spectrum, but he himself is not. And that's been something for me that's been a huge resource and asset for me is being with someone who is um, neurodiverse, affirming and celebrating, but neurotypical. I mean, honestly, uh, as many of you know, Travis is a huge part of why I'm um, so functional is because he takes care of a lot of the things um, in the uh, practical physical realm uh, that we need here in our society and so just want to give a big shout out to travis for loving his neurodiverse girls so there's a lot more to say um but i'm gonna actually kind of leave it for there because one thing too that's common quality of someone being autistic is our tendency to overshare and um you know sometimes i have a, a kickback from that and a vulnerability hangover and Honestly, I'm just not sure if that's going to happen this time. But I do want to say that um, I'm really grateful to the people in my life, including you, that I've gotten to share this with. And in my last class that I taught, How to Read a Birth Chart um, Master Class, which was the favorite, my favorite class that I've ever taught, I got to unmask in that class and I got to share with the students in real time um, that I'm autistic. And my my readings that I was demonstrating in that class got to what I call an oracular or divinatory reading space. And that for me is like just unmasked. And I, and I know it's why a lot of you love me, right? And so I want to say a lot of the things that you love about me are the ways that I'm autistic and the way that my soul in this lifetime filters itself through or channels itself through this particular um, brain makeup. So if any of you here are listening to this and wondering if you're autistic or if your child's autistic or someone in your life is autistic, um, it, it is, I understand, a big process to wake up to and I just love you so much and there are really incredible resources in this day and age where folks are doing the most incredible work like uh, Mrs. Speechy P, a Meaningful Speech, and so many others of you out there um, who are loving and supporting us through this process. All right, you all. I think that's all I'm going to say for today. Thank you so much for letting me be here. And um, thank you for you being you. It takes all types to make the world go around. And who we are is a natural and necessary part of evolution. And when society wakes up to and builds all of our structures in uh, light of that knowing 
we will have entered into the Aquarian age and Pluto and Aquarius will be about the transformation of our civilization to truly um, include all of our diversity as the unique gems that each and every single human soul is. And by doing that, we will live in a loving, compassionate, and highly creative and exciting world. Um, you know, we all do incredible things, but I will say this to my big shout out to all folks on the spectrum. We bring so much color, magic, and light, and light to this world. Um, I think we're a huge part of what makes Earth uh, worth living. All right, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for being here and I'll see you next time. We are dreamed into existence. What we do with that dream is up to us. How we dream is as important as what we dream. For the what of the dream knows itself through the how.